pro-life concerns over a possible Trump running mate, why some groups think he should not be considered. New details about the deadly Dallas ambush. The police chief shares what they're learning about the sniper. Growing nuclear threat. The U.S. tries to contain North Korea's aggressive weapons development. And the Pope picks an American journalist to carry his message to the world. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Monday, July 11, 2016. Good evening from Washington. Thank you for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick. A pro-life group wants one of Donald Trump's potential running mates disqualified for openly supporting abortion rights. Both parties are hashing out their platforms on abortion. Jason Calvey covers that debate for us tonight. Jason? Brian, the Republican Party is writing this year's platform this week. Part of the 2012 platform says the Constitution protects the right to life of the unborn. But one of Donald Trump's possible VP picks, retired Army General Michael Flynn, is pushing back at that pro-life stance. Retired General Michael Flynn on ABC's This Week says women are so important in that decision-making process. They are the ones that have to make the decision because they're the ones that are going to decide to bring up that child or not. He is uh, pro-abortion and that absolutely disqualifies him from consideration. National pro-life group Susan B. Anthony List says the general's views would hurt the presumptive GOP nominee. It would completely weaken the commitments that Donald Trump has made to the pro-life movement for him to select a pro-abortion VP. People betting on Trump's VP pick are favoring Indiana Governor Mike Pence. That's the first choice of Trump supporter Day Gardner. She knew Governor Pence when he was in the U.S. House. Mike Pence had a very open door policy when he's here, especially with regard to pro-lifers. He's very strongly pro-life. He's just a really nice man. Donald Trump says he opposes abortion, with exceptions. But pro-lifers already in Cleveland say the draft of the Republican platform is solidly pro-life. I've seen the draft copy of the platform for the RNC and it's looking very strong. There are no attempts at this point to, to weaken the language. The, the platform protects life in all circumstances. Other conservative groups say the GOP will also defend marriage. The platform says that marriage is between a man and a woman and that that's the best condition for families uh, and for children growing up. Uh, regarding transgender bathrooms, it says that the Obama administration overreached. And we've also seen the draft Democratic platform. It says they're committed to promoting abortion, funding Planned Parenthood, and for the first time ever, Democrats call for getting rid of the Hyde Amendment. That's a long-standing rule that bans federal funds from going to elective abortions. And Brian Susan B. Anthony List calls this the most extreme platform in decades. Thank you, Jason Calvey. And as Jason mentioned, Indiana Governor Mike Pence leads Donald Trump's list of potential running mates. The two appear, appear together again tomorrow at a Republican fundraiser in Indianapolis. I'm very glad that... Uh... They scheduled a public rally. I think the opportunity for Hoosiers to hear from him directly uh, is exciting. Uh, and uh, I, I look forward to joining him there. And if he wants me to bring a few words, I'd be happy to. Pence has until Friday to decide if he'll run for another term as Indiana's governor or join Trump's ticket if he's offered. Indiana law will not allow him to do both. Trump is expected to name his vice presidential pick by the end of this week. Mexico's president scoffs at Trump's proposal for a border wall financed by his country. There is no way that Mexico can pay a wall like that. But any decision can be taken for the uh, government of the United States. Enrique Peña Nieto tells CNN Mexico will work with the U.S. to improve security but cannot pay for a proposed border wall. Hillary Clinton is about to get the endorsement of one-time rival Bernie Sanders. They will campaign together tomorrow in New Hampshire. Sanders has been pushing the Clinton campaign to support elements of his progressive agenda. They include a $15 minimum wage and expanded access to health care. And a new poll shows the controversy over Hillary Clinton's private email server hurt her image, but not her support among voters. A Washington Post ABC News poll says 56 percent of Americans disapprove of the FBI's decision not to seek criminal charges, but a majority 58% also say the issue will not affect their vote. Other stories our EWTN News Nightly team is covering in today's world. President Obama travels to Dallas tomorrow. 
He'll be joined there by former President George W. Bush at a memorial for the five police officers killed in an ambush. The president plans to meet privately with the officers' families. Dallas police will get help from nearby Arlington, Texas, with security for the president's visit. Chief David Brown says his department is running on empty, on fumes, after last week's deadly ambush. Wyatt Goolsby reports from the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial here in Washington. Wyatt. Brian, the families of the Dallas police officers say they are thankful for the support they've received. Across the country, Americans have been leaving flowers and notes at police memorials like this one here in Washington, many of them saying they'll keep the Dallas Police Department in their prayers. More than 100 motorcycle riders from across Texas came to Dallas to pay their respects to the officers killed in Thursday's shooting. And across the nation, people of faith have been praying for peace and justice. This is the best department in the country, and I'm proud to be associated with the men and women of the Dallas Police Department. And this tragedy incident will not discourage us. Chief Brown says they are taking all threats, including a private Facebook message to the police department, seriously. Authorities are downloading more than 170 hours of body camera footage and dash cam video. Five officers died and nine others were injured during a protest in downtown Dallas. The gunman, 25-year-old Micah Xavier Johnson, was killed by a remote-controlled robot bomb. It's a device typically used to disarm explosives. Brown is defending his decision to use it. And the only way to either get a sniper shot to end his trying to kill us would be to expose officers to grave danger. We had negotiated with him for about two hours. Uh, and he just basically lying to us, playing games, laughing at us, singing. Brown says Johnson had planned to kill even more police officers. He told negotiators he believed he was doing the right thing in making them pay for punishing people of color. Friends and family of the slain officers say they are grateful for the outpouring of support. Laura Zamaripa lost her brother Patrick, a former Navy veteran, in the ambush. But. I mean, my brother left his country and his community, so I just can't wrap my mind around it. It's just so unreal. The family of one of the other officers killed, Brent Thompson, is asking for prayers not only for the families, but for all police. Now, this investigation is far from over. Authorities still have to do an autopsy on Micah Johnson, and they'll have to further investigate his home, where they actually found bomb-making materials. Brian? At the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial here in Washington, Wyatt Goolsby, thank you. Dozens of people protesting last week's fatal police shootings of two black men are arrested in Baton Rouge, Louisiana over the weekend. Police say the protesters were moving toward an interstate ramp trying to block it. Officials in full riot gear made the arrest after issuing a warning. As many as 40 protesters were taken to the local jail. More than 100 people were arrested this weekend at St. Paul, Minnesota after blocking Interstate 94. Police say the protesters threw bottles, bricks, and fireworks at officers. They were taken to jail by the busload. Bishop Harry Jackson Jr. is founder and chairman of the High Impact Leadership Coalition. You were out of the country while this was going on. Yes. What was your reaction when you heard about, especially the Dallas shooting? Well, I was asked, is America going crazy by the Brits? And I was not surprised. I think we've been waiting for these kinds of things to explode because essentially the protesters who are nonviolent are saying, you're not hearing us, there are problems. And then there is a anarchistic group that has somehow moved in among the legitimate protesters. And those guys want to shake things up. So I think we've got a kind of kettle that's boiling over at this time, Brian. I grew up in the 60s. I remember that terrible racial divide. Are we there again? What can be done to start to heal this? Well, I think we've got to recognize that the problems we face are both long-term and short-term. Short-term, I think we can use the resources of the church to build bridges to peace. We have a movement called the Reconciled Church uh, Initiative, which is bringing together people across racial bounds and denominational boundaries. And groups like that can do some amazing things. And we've got a website that talks about some examples. But for example, Bishop T.D. Jakes, Dallas, Texas, has a Texas Offenders Reentry Initiative, which takes hopeless people who have done time in prison, 
many nonviolent offenders, help them regain their lives. There are other initiatives that deal with poverty, education. I think we've got to see that we've got a class, a race, and then a generational poverty problem. And unfortunately, many of the people that are so violent are young people. That means this is not going to go away with this generation unless the church takes positive, concerted action. There's such distrust between these groups. Is there mm -hmm. any way to build that trust? I think, again, I think the church can do it. Another group is Operation Blue Shield um, that is operating in Dallas, Texas. It brings together law enforcement officers, churches, community leaders. What they do is take those folks through an 18-month process of meeting every month and mapping out a plan to bring safety in the community. So safety has to come first, reinvestment in housing second, then business bringing jobs third to bring economic revitalization. It is good to know that something is being done. Bishop Harry Jackson, thank you for joining us. Thank you, sir. Well, 560 more American troops are going to Iraq. Defense Secretary Ash Carter made the announcement during a visit to that war-torn country today. After regaining control of Fallujah, Iraqi troops are trying to push ISIS militants now out of Mosul. This contingent will help the Iraqis establish a logistical springboard for their offensive in Mosul, which Prime Minister Abadi reaffirmed to me that he wants to accomplish this year. Carter says the U.S. troops will help secure an air base near Mosul. North Korea threatens to end diplomatic communication channels with the U.S. There are also hints tonight of harsher punishment for Americans detained there. Pyongyang is angry over sanctions against North Korea's leader and a decision to deploy an advanced missile defense system. Chief White House correspondent and political director Lauren Ashburn reports. Lauren. Brian, in his quest to rid the world of nuclear weapons, President Obama announced Friday that South Korea and the U.S. will deploy an advanced missile defense system. It's called THAAD, and it shoots down nuclear ballistic missiles at an incredible speed and altitude. North Korea threatens retribution. Since June, North Korea has been testing ballistic missiles. If THAAD is deployed, North Korea says it will take a physical counteraction. South Korean President Park Jun-hai says the decision to deploy THAAD is purely a defensive measure and it won't target countries. North Korea tested a submarine-based ballistic missile Saturday, which South Korea said was unsuccessful. It also fired two mobile intermediate-range missiles in June. South Korea condemned these tests, calling it a, quote, clear violation of UN Security Council resolution. Earlier today, Japan's prime minister, long concerned about North Korea's nuclear development, was given the go-ahead to change its constitution to protect against nuclear warheads. That is just a part of the president's nuclear plan. According to the Washington Post, he is determined to use his final six months in office to take a series of executive actions to advance his nuclear agenda. Sources tell the Post the orders could include a landmark no first use policy for the U.S. and a U.N. Security Council resolution affirming a nuclear weapon testing ban. Brian. Thank you. Lauren Ashburn of the White House. Great Britain gets a new prime minister this week, Home Secretary Theresa May. Marit May says she is honored and humbled to lead the UK's exit from the European Union, even though she advocated against Brexit. May's only rival withdrew from the race to head the Conservative Party and replace Prime Minister David Cameron. Cameron plans to step down Wednesday after unsuccessfully campaigning for Britain to remain in the EU. Pope Francis names an American as his official spokesman and a Spanish woman to be deputy press secretary. St. Louis native Greg Burke takes over from Italian Jesuit father Federico Lombardi. Paloma Garcia Oberejo, the Vatican correspondent for a Spanish broadcaster, will be his deputy, the first woman to hold the post. Burke says he is honored. I'm thrilled. I'm a little bit nervous, I have to admit. I mean, it is a huge job. Uh, fortunately, I've been here the last six months working with Father Lombardi. I can't say enough good things about him in terms of just his dedication, generosity, and kindness, and patience would be the other thing. It's a long list of virtues, so I hope to uh, pick up part of that. Burke, a veteran journalist, is the former Fox Rome correspondent. He previously spent 10 years at Time magazine. His new deputy says the fact that she is a woman isn't really groundbreaking for the church. I'm the first woman, okay. So what? Isn't the Virgin Mary the first woman in the church? 
The changes are effective August 1st, part of an overhaul of the Vatican's entire communications operation. Coming up, a mass to remember a Spanish bullfighter, the unusual tragedy that claimed his life. And inmates surprise jailers by breaking out to help a guard. Cari fratelli e sorelle, buongiorno. Pope Francis greeting the crowds gathering to pray the Angelus with him on Sunday, the Holy Father commenting on the parable of the Good Samaritan, urging generosity toward our neighbor not to talk but to act. Thanks for joining us this Monday evening. I'm Brian Patrick. People in Spain attend a funeral mass for a bullfighter who died after being gored by a bull over the weekend. Victor Barrio, whose death played out on live TV, is the first Spanish matador to die in the ring since 1985. Medics who rushed to help him were unable to save his life. Texas Governor Greg Abbott may miss next week's Republican National Convention. He was accidentally scalded by hot water while visiting Jackson Hole, Wyoming with his family last week. His office says Abbott suffered extensive second and third degree burns on both legs and feet. Abbott is confined to a wheelchair since suffering a paralyzing injury in 1984. Surveillance video shows an unusual rescue. Inmates break out of a Texas courthouse holding cell to help a corrections officer who had passed out. The guard is revived with a defibrillator as the inmates watch with concern after being returned to that holding cell. A federal court considers whether Florida can continue denying higher cost kosher meals to Jewish prisoners. The state does provide more expensive specialized diets for inmates with medical needs. Diana Verm is counsel, legal counsel at the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty, representing the Jewish prisoners. Does the state of Florida have a legitimate argument that these meals are too expensive? No, Florida has greatly overestimated the cost of providing kosher meals. They said at one point it, it might cost $40 million when the federal government, the whole federal government, only costs 400000 to provide kosher meals to their prisoners. A lot of people think when you go to prison you lose all your rights. Do prisoners have a right to practice their faith? You do lose some of your physical rights when you enter prison, but you don't lose your human dignity, and that means your right to seek truth and your right to practice your faith. And it's so important for the government to recognize that human dignity because if they, if you lose the human dignity for a prisoner, what could the government do for all Americans? I'm wondering if the prison system accommodates people of other religions. For instance, can Catholics get meatless meals on Fridays during Lent? There are vegetarian meals and vegan meals for prisoners who request them, so yes, but there are other complaints that, the, that Florida has not provided either. How does Florida compare in this area to other states? 35 other states and the federal government all provide kosher meals. Florida is the only large prison system that doesn't provide kosher meals to its prisoners. Why is it so important for the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty to defend people in these situations? You defend, of course, EWTN and its challenge of uh, the HHS mandate and many other cases. Why this case? We think that religious liberty for prisoners is important for re religious liberty for all Americans. If a prisoner can practice his faith, then all Americans can practice their faith. And in these cases, there's a practical reason as well. Studies have shown that if prisoners are allowed to practice their faith in prison, then there's less violence in prison, and they're more likely to, uh, there's less recidivism once they leave prison. It makes good sense. Diana Verm with the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Up next, Pope Francis makes plans to connect with Christian, Muslim, and Jewish leaders. And cultural concern, author Mary Eberstadt talks about the rise of secularism. Today, July 11th, the church celebrates St. Benedict, who wrote his famous rule, the basis for all Western monastic life. The sixth century abbot is the patron saint of Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI's pontificate and co-patron of Europe. Thanks for joining us this Monday evening. I'm Brian Patrick. Pope Francis adds a strong interreligious dimension to an already politically delicate trip. He'll meet with Christian, Muslim, and Jewish leaders during his fall visit to the former Soviet republics of Georgia and Azerbaijan. The Vatican released the Holy Father's itinerary today for the trip. It originally was planned as an extension of the Pope's recent visit to Armenia. The U.S. Senate unanimously consents to a genocide resolution passed earlier by the House of Representatives. It declares ISIS is committing genocide against Christians and other religious minorities in the Middle East. That measure supports the use of every reasonable means to destroy ISIS and disrupt its support networks. 
A recent Supreme Court ruling reflects an alarming trend about religion in our American culture. Lauren Ashburn and Mary Eberstadt discussed the topic during an interview recorded earlier. Mary Eberstadt is the author of It's Dangerous to Believe, Religious Freedom and Its Enemies. Mary, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Lauren. Tell me about secularism. You talk about that in your book. How did it become so widely accepted in our culture? Well, it didn't happen overnight. At the end of World War II, there was actually a religious boom in this country and most other Western countries, and a lot has changed since then. We saw the invention of the birth control pill, the rise of the new atheism, which set a new low bar for how religious believers could be mocked. And following that, we've seen an increasing rise in anti-religious sentiment to where we are today. Now, the recent Supreme Court rulings are what you wrote about in part in your latest National Review article. Um, they say something about the state of our country. What is that state? The most interesting thing about those rulings was the way that the Texas abortion decision was received. You saw people on the steps of the Supreme Court weeping and dancing and really behaving like members of a religious sect. And happy that the Supreme Court said that in Texas they cannot restrict abortion clinics, meaning that abortion clinics need to stay open, basically. Yes. They were deliriously happy to know that there would be more abortion in this country. And the point is that secularism has given rise to a rival faith. We really need to understand this. This is something new in Western civilization. It's a faith that is based on the sexual revolution and its perceived prerogatives, and guarding the revolution is the first business of this new secular faith. And it's a faith without God, basically. Uh, you said that the Supreme Court treats abortion like a religion. What do you mean by that? I mean abortion has become their chief sacrament, and the safeguarding of it is such that no attempts to curtail it will be permitted. People are absolutists about this on the pro-choice side. And in the book and elsewhere, I try to lay out what it is they believe doctrinally. They have a, a hagiography, they have the equivalent of saints, they have a demonology, they have rituals. And we need to understand that this is a brand new thing in Western civilization, this secularist faith in the sexual revolution. Mary Eberstadt, thank you so much for joining us. Her book is called It's Dangerous to Believe Religious Freedom and Its Enemies. Thanks, Lauren. That conversation, of course, recorded earlier. For the EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Brian Patrick. Thank you for joining us this evening. Good night. God bless you.